I would like to introduce Dr. Rebecca Cobb and with her lecture, The Elephant in the Bedroom, Talking About Sex. Dr. Cobb. Thank you very much, Bettina, and thanks everyone for coming today. I did want to mention that um, I do teach two courses that you might take in a few years in psychology, and one is Psych 362, which is the main course for me on close relationships, and I should have put also Psych 367, which is my course on um, psychological perspectives on human sexuality. So if the kinds of things we're talking about today are of interest to you, then you should look for those courses a couple of years down the road in your degree. So sexual issues often end up being the elephant in the bedroom. Ever present, awkward to work around, completely obvious to both parties, and yet often completely ignored. However, communicating about sexual preferences and desires and wants and dislikes might be really critical for people's sexual satisfaction. So imagine a couple who's no longer interested in sexual activity with each other. They still love each other, they've been together for a while, but they just don't feel attracted to each other anymore. They really worry about what this means for their relationship and for each other, but they're reluctant to talk about it because it makes them feel really anxious and they feel threatened. They're worried, am I gonna hurt my partner's feelings if I bring this up? And they're afraid this conversation isn't going to go well and it might become an angry and frustrated argument. It's no surprise that couples have a hard time talking about sex. It can be really embarrassing. It can be scary. You don't want to hurt people's feelings. And it's really hard sometimes to express these vulnerable thoughts and feelings, even with the person who loves you most. And why is that? Well, we don't really have a lot of great models for talking about sex. Parents have a tough time talking to their kids about sex, and we don't tend to talk to our friends about sexual issues the same way we do about all kinds of other relationship issues. But the problem is, if couples avoid talking about these really important things in their relationship, it's just going to cause more problems and dissatisfaction down the road. So my research that I've been doing with my team here at SFU suggests that one of the best strategies is that during sexual activity, try to communicate without words. In other words, use nonverbal behavior or sounds to try and communicate what you're enjoying and what you're not finding so pleasurable. So you can move a partner's hand either away or towards something. You can use pressure on their hand to direct them to slow things down or speed things up. And what we find is that when people use these kinds of nonverbal communications, they're actually having more satisfying sexual relationships. And if they're talking, it doesn't seem to be as um, useful in terms of fostering the kind of sexual relationship that people want. And there's a couple of reasons we think this might be. First of all, it might be really difficult to just say what you're enjoying and what you're not enjoying. It's kind of threatening to say these things in the moment. And it might be really hard for your partner to hear as well. And talking can also be distracting. It might just take you right out of that moment. You can't enjoy what's happening. You're not paying attention to those pleasurable sensations because now you're thinking about, oh, what is my partner saying? But there's lots of times when nonverbal communication just won't cut it. And that might be true around issues of consent or if there's a real problem, or maybe it's just too complicated to convey your meaning non-verbally. And unfortunately, we know that couples find it really tough to initiate these conversations. They actually perceive sexual conversations to be the most anxiety provoking in their relationship, more so than any other kinds of conflict discussions. And the rather, um, uh, ironic thing is that when we actually watch couples having these discussions compared to non-sexual conflict discussions, they tend to actually be warmer and less dominating in these sexual discussions. And so it's interesting that people feel a lot of stress and anxiety about them, and yet they seem to be a little bit more um, uh, constructive than other kinds of conversations. And we think that's probably because people go into them knowing, oh, this is kind of scary and I feel a little bit vulnerable and I'm worried about my partner. And so they actually take more care when they're having these kinds of conversations. What we don't really know as much about in terms of sexual communication is what distinguishes the conversations of couples who are sexually happy compared to those who are sexually dissatisfied. 
Um, we also don't know a lot about what qualities of these conversations predict trajectories of change. In other words, if we look at how are people right now talking about their sexual issues, how does that predict how their relationship changes and develops over time? And that's the focus of the research that my team and I have been conducting at SFU. And today I want to tell you about a study that we, we conducted here where we had um, just over 100 mixed sex cohabiting couples come into the lab and we endeavored to uh, recruit as diverse a group as we could. Um, unfortunately, we still end up with a lot of uh, Caucasian participants, which is typical for research that we do around here. Um, these people were in their late 20s and they've been together for about four years. So they were all living together. They didn't have kids and um, none of them were pregnant. And most of these couples were monogamous, but there was a proportion of them who were what we call consensually non-monogamous. In other words, they had arrangements in their relationship that allowed for um, sexual or romantic activity with other people. And those were consensual non-monogamies like polyamory or swinging or other kinds of open relationships. So we had these couples come into the lab and we first asked them to consider some area in their sexual relationship that was a problem or concern or a tension between the two of them. And then we had them talk about it for 10 minutes while we videotaped them. And then we looked at those video recordings later and we coded them for certain qualities like the emotions that were displayed, um, the meaning that people made about the sexual issue, and some broader qualities of the discussion that I'll tell you about in a minute. They also provided us with self-report questionnaires about their sexual satisfaction and dissatisfaction. And one of the things that you'll learn if you take any psychology courses is that psychologists love questionnaires. So we gave people lots of questionnaires, but today I'm going to focus explicitly on the sexual satisfaction side of things. And we followed them for um, four questionnaires over a year, and that allows us to look at change over time. So we can see if people increase in sexual satisfaction or if they decline in sexual satisfaction. And we can look at the qualities of the sexual discussion and how that predicts those trajectories. So one of the first things that we were really interested in were attributions. Attributions are the explanations that people make about the cause of other people's behavior. So when we think about sexual issues or problems, a lot of times as human beings, we try to figure out why is this happening? Why is that person doing that? Why am I doing this? And those explanations that we generate are the attributions. And sometimes we generate attributions that are more positive. So we attribute other people's negative behavior to things that are external to them. But if we um, attribute their behavior as being caused by something about who they are, then we're getting into the realm of what we think of as negative attributions. So for example, if we think about that couple that I brought up at the beginning, if the female partner is thinking, geez, you know, he doesn't want to have sex with me because he's just a lazy jerk. Well, that's an explanation for the behavior. And it's internal. It's about him as a person. And it's really what we call a blame attribution. And the more that people make those kinds of negative blame attributions, usually the less happy they are in their relationship. And if, if this female partner were to have said instead, gee, you know, I don't think my partner really wants to have sex these days because he's so busy at work. He's overwhelmed with trying to adapt to the COVID crisis and the pandemic. And he just really doesn't have time and he's just too tired. Those kinds of attributions are what we call external attributions. It's something that's not about him as a person. It's something about the partner's current circumstances that are leading to the problem. And when we think about attributions, people can make attributions that are about themselves, so a self-attribution. They can make it about other people, so a partner attribution. And they can also make it about circumstances. So let me give you some examples. These are from the study. One person said, I noticed there was a change in my sex drive when we moved in with your parents. Um, so this is an external attribution, something about the circumstances that's creating this problem. But it's not about um, one person's circumstances, it's about the couple. So it's about what are we coping with as a, as a couple, as a team, that's causing this problem. 
Here's another one. Your sex drive really went down when you started antidepressants. So again, it's an external cause. The antidepressants are causing the lack of libido, um, but it's about the partner. So it's a partner um, relevant attribution. These ones are more what we call the blame attributions. These are the negative ones. We haven't had much sex lately because you're out of shape. That's a partner blame attribution. I'm really seeing it as your fault that we're in this situation. Another one would be, I have no sex drive. There's something wrong with me. So if somebody's really blaming themselves um, or they're blaming the partner, you can imagine that these kinds of attributions are not really going to be very good for relationships. And what we know is that generally speaking, the more blame attributions and the fewer of those external positive attributions that people make, the less happy they are in their relationships generally and if these attributions are about sexual problems, it tends to be related to greater severity of sexual dysfunction and greater sexual dissatisfaction. So I do have some video examples to show you, um, just to give you an idea of the way people talked about these kinds of issues in their relationship. So those are some examples of the attributions we were interested in, but we were also interested in some more broad examples or qualities of these discussions. So we coded things like synchrony, dominance, shared perspective, and openness. So when we think about synchrony, we're really thinking about, is this couple passing the conversational baton effectively? Is their conversation coordinated? Are they kind of on the same page? Do they respond to each other well? And when you see a conversation where there's synchrony, you're seeing people engaging in turn taking and being sensitive to each other versus talking over or interrupting, or they hear a person say something and they go off on some tangent. Um, dominance would be kind of overbearing, taking control of the conversation, only talking about one's own point of view. Um, and it could also be, it could be verbal dominance, but it could also be even some physical like leaning towards people or pointing. Those would be um, examples of dominance. We also coded their shared perspective. Um, some of these conversations that couples had were really funny. We would watch the entire 10 minutes and we wouldn't have a clue what their conversation was about or that they saw things in exactly the same way. They seem to be talking about two different kinds of problems sometimes. Um, so a lot of the couples really saw things in similar ways. So they agreed about what the problem was, um, how, what to do about it, and uh, you know what the causes were. But others really seemed like they were two different problems. Um, openness was another um, big issue that we noticed that some couples were very transparent, very matter of fact. They were very open and direct about their thoughts and feelings. And then we had other couples who would talk for the whole 10 minutes and we would be like, what? what was the problem? We don't get what's happening here because they would talk around things or use metaphors or use like code words that we just didn't understand. Then we also were very interested in their emotions. So you guys probably, if you think about the last time you had an argument with someone, I bet you remember a lot more about how you felt and what it felt like when your partner was angry or upset or frustrated with you. And I bet you don't remember as well the exact words that people used. The emotional context of people's conversations really matters. And sometimes we think it might matter even more than what people say because it's what's very salient and it's what people remember. And we were interested broadly in expressions of positive emotions such as humor and warmth and interest and also broadly negative emotions such as anger, frustration, sadness, and anxiety. And as you might expect, the more couples engage with positive emotions and the fewer negative emotions, we expected that this would foster a sense of sexual satisfaction in their relationship over time. Okay, so I wanna show you some examples here um, that demonstrate some of the emotions. So if you wanna go ahead and pause the recording, All right, so let's move on to some of the data and the results now. And what I'm gonna talk about first is those attributions. And I'm also going to first talk about predicting changes in women's sexual satisfaction. So let me just find the laser pointer. So on this axis of the graph right here, 
we have changes in women's sexual satisfaction. And on the bottom graph uh, of the graph, we have time and months. So you remember that people were in the study for about a year and nobody ever fills out their questionnaires on time, which is why we look like we're going out to 18 months. Then what you can see, first of all, is that both of these lines are going down. What does that mean? Well, sadly, it means that on average, women's sexual satisfaction declines over time. This is not unusual. Usually when we follow couples over time, we find that on average, their sexual satisfaction and their relationship satisfaction does tend to decline with time. That doesn't mean that it's true for everybody. Some people stay stable, some people go down, some people go up, and some people just kind of go up and down over time. But on average, what we tend to see is declines. I know that's kind of sad, and I hope I haven't disappointed some of you. Um, but what we're interested in here is how those blame attributions change the trajectory of women's sexual satisfaction over time. So regardless of how many blame attributions they made in these discussions, women's sexual satisfaction goes down on average. But you can see from the red line that the more they do this, the more steeply their sexual satisfaction declines compared to the women who don't make a lot of these partner blame attributions. Now, I'm guessing this is not going to be a big surprise for you guys. Of course, blaming other people for problems probably isn't going to help your relationship uh, become satisfied over time. And so this is exactly what we expected. The more we blame other people as women, we blame our male partners for what's going on sexually, the less happy we are with time. Now with this graph, I'm again showing you changes in women's sexual satisfaction. And again, we have time and months here along the bottom. And what we're looking at here is those external partner attributions. So it's not his fault we're not having sex. It's really this like stressful circumstance that he's experiencing. And again, you can see declines over time for both groups, but this blue line here is actually a little bit steeper. Right, so faster declines in satisfaction in the blue group. And that's the group where the women were making fewer of these external partner attributions. So the more that they said, it's not him, it's circumstances, that actually buffered declines in sexual satisfaction. Um, so again, this was kind of what we were expecting. Now this is the external couple attributions that women made. And this would be things like, well, you know, our sex life has really been suffering since we moved in with your parents. And again, we have women's sexual satisfaction and we have time and months, and then we have these external attributions. And the more that women made those external attributions, the more quickly their sexual satisfaction declined. The women who didn't make a lot of them, their satisfaction's looking a little bit more stable. Now, you guys might be thinking, wait a minute, I'm confused. I thought these external attributions were supposed to be good for people. And it turns out that that's only true if it's about the partner. If it's an external couple level attribution, the opposite of what we expected happened. So the more people made those external couple attributions, the more quickly their sexual satisfaction declined. And we were kind of wondering, well, what, what's going on here? Why is this happening? This is not what we had expected. So we went back and took a look at what exactly these women were saying in the videos. And what we found is that they were talking about some really chronic, ongoing, problematic circumstances, like living with roommates, living with parents, um, living in really you know, bad home situations, um, both people going to school and that's not ending for like several years. So a lot of the things people described were really impinging on their sexual lives quite considerably. And they weren't things that were likely to change over the course of the study. So in this case, we think it's not really so much about people's perceptions that this is external to the relationship. It's really that they're describing genuinely difficult and challenging circumstances that were making it hard for them to have happy sexual relationships. Now, this is the only cross-partner finding that we had. In this case, what we're looking at is women's sexual satisfaction and time again. But this time we're talking about the predictor is men's self-blame attributions. So when you think about a relationship, there's two people. The way I think about the relationship affects my satisfaction. That's a within partner finding. 
but the way that I feel about our relationship and my behavior is also going to affect my partner. And that's a cross partner finding. So in this case, what we find is that the degree to which um, men engaged in self blame, that's this red line here, that buffer declines in their female partner's sexual satisfaction. So the less men self blamed, the less they took responsibility for the sexual issue, the more steeply their female partner's sexual satisfaction declined over time. And again, this was a surprise to us because we thought that blame attributions were just going to be bad all the time. So again, we took a look at what's really happening here. And what we see is that the more men take responsibility for what's happening, the more they say, this is on me, this is my responsibility, it's because of what I'm doing that we're having this problem. The more men do that, the happier their female partners are in their sexual relationship over time. So it seems like men might be taking responsibility in a way that really motivates change. So if men are saying, wow, you know, we know from sexual scripts, like sort of what the media tells us and what culture tells us, that men are often seen as the ones who should be responsible for how a sexual relationship is going. And if men are thinking, geez, I'm not doing my job as a man, I need to step up here, I need to fix things, I need to make my partner happy, that might really motivate them to take some concrete steps to improve their sexual relationship, which really ultimately benefits their female partner. Now, one of the things you might be thinking is, hmm, so far, we have only talked about how women's sexual satisfaction changes. What's happened to the men? What's going on with them? Well, we didn't find that any of these attributions predicted trajectories of change in men's sexual satisfaction. And what do we make of this? Well, maybe men just don't care what the source of the problem is. They only care that there is a problem. So men might be far more concerned about the fact that there's a sexual problem or a sexual tension or that the relationship is not going well in the bedroom, and they really don't care whose problem it is or whose fault it is or why it's happening. We know that women do tend to be more analytical about relationships, if you will. They like to figure out, why is this happening? Why, why are we doing this? Why is my partner doing this? And so it might be that these explanations actually do matter much more for women because they're a little bit more likely to engage in that attributional process. Whereas men, they don't care. Your problem, my problem, who cares? Let's just fix it. What about those broader, pattern, broader patterns that I talked about, like synchrony and dominance? and the emotions of these conversations. How did they play a role in what's going on? Well, first of all, we looked at the difference between couples who were sexually satisfied at baseline and couples who were less sexually satisfied. So we compared the two groups to see were there differences on any of these qualities that we assessed. And what we found is that couples who are sexually satisfied at the start of our study when they have these discussions tend to have uh, men who show a lot more warmth in the discussions. Um, the men showed lots less frustration, but they also surprisingly showed more sadness. And so what we think might be happening there is that men who are sexually satisfied, even if there are problems, are more um, comfortable showing some of these vulnerable emotions. So they feel like it's safe to share their sadness. And I want you to remember that sadness one when we get to some of the next findings. Um, there weren't any differences on things like synchrony or dominance or shared perspective or openness, which was a bit of a surprise to us. Um, but the thing to remember is that these couples, they were all relatively in the satisfied range when it came to their sex lives. So we didn't maybe have as much variability in terms of sexual dissatisfaction that we might have wanted. Let's talk about the trajectories again. So you remember that, you know, so far we've talked about how do women's sexual satisfaction change and attributions do predict changes in women's sexual satisfaction and they didn't predict changes in men's. But now that we're looking at some of those broader qualities and emotions, we start to see what matters for men's sexual quality trajectories. And synchrony appears to be critical for both men and women's sexual quality. The more synchronous those conversations were at the beginning of the study, 
the more sexually satisfied men and women became over time. And I say that deliberately because usually what we're talking about is um, either less steep or more steep declines in satisfaction. But the really interesting thing was that the more synchronous these conversations were, these couples actually experienced increases over the one year in their sexual satisfaction, which was pretty surprising. We also see that the less men showed anger in those discussions, the more sexually satisfied the men and women became over time. The more interest women showed, the more satisfied men were, and the more women showed humor, the more satisfied they were over time. So this is all pretty much in line with what we had been expecting. But I do have some findings that were unexpected. That's sort of the story of this talk, unexpected findings about sexual conversations. Um, so what you can see in blue is that we do have some things that surprised us a little. The more men showed frustration, and the more men showed anxiety, and the more women showed dominance, the more satisfied we saw these couples getting over the year. And you can see that, you know, for the men's anxiety, it was their own satisfaction. For women's dominance, it was their own satisfaction. And again, what might be happening is that sometimes emotions are motivating. Emotions serve a purpose in our life and they serve a purpose in our relationships. And if men are frustrated and anxious and they're actually um, expressing those emotions to their partner, during these conversations, then that might signal, wow, okay, these are really important things. This is something we have to deal with. This really matters to my partner and it matters to me. And we need to do something to make this better. So they might be just really key in terms of drawing people's attention to issues that need to be dealt with. The women's dominance was interesting because in previous research, we had seen that these conversations, people tended to be less dominant, but to the degree that these women were exhibiting dominance, which we generally think of as not such a fantastic thing, um, these women became more satisfied over time. And again, we kind of went back and thought a little bit about what is it that we were really coding? What did we really see happening in those conversations? And women's dominance um, really happened when they took control of this conversation about sexuality and sexual issues. They made sure that their perspective was heard. They um, promoted understanding of their point of view and what they wanted to happen in response to the problem. And so it seems as though, at least in this type of conversation, that this women's dominance really reflected women taking personal control over these conversations in a way that was really helpful. So that prevented them from becoming dissatisfied over time in their sexual relationship. So in conclusion, how couples understand the causes of their sexual issues and the source of the sexual conflicts or difficulties and whether or not they communicate these explanations to each other seems to really matter, but especially for women. So women really care about the meaning that they and their partner are making about the source of sexual conflicts and tensions. And women also seem to want their male partners to take some responsibility. And as targets of interventions, we should probably be helping women to reduce their partner blame because that is not helping them in terms of their sexual relationship. And one of the reasons might be that the more women blame their partner, the less they see whatever is the problem as under their personal control. So if it's really all him, I can't make him change. I can't make him do what I want. And that means I give away all my control about the sexual issue to somebody else. Um, we should probably be helping women reduce their personal or their partner blame, as I said, but also we found that their dominance mattered. So finding a personal voice in these conversations is probably really important. Um, also, given what we know about those couple level external attributions, we really need to be helping couples who've identified genuine chronic circumstances that are interfering with their relationship. And we're either going to need to help them change those, those situations if we can, or we might have to work with them on tolerance building. So figuring out ways to not allow those circumstances to negatively affect their relationship in the way that it might be. We also know that emotional tone is really critical. Um, and it's clear that not all negative emotions should be treated alike when it comes to these conversations. Um, 
emotional tone seems to be a little bit more of a robust predictor than just the qualities of the discussion. And the more women are showing interest and humor and the less anger they're showing, the better off these couples are going to be. Um, but the expression by men of some emotions such as frustration and sadness might actually be really potent motivating forces that buffer declines in sexual satisfaction over time. So if you and your partner are willing to commit to talking about sexual issues openly, honestly, directly, and doing so in a non-blaming way with warmth and humor, you may be able to create a sense of intimacy and trust and connection that's really going to make your sex life more satisfying. And you just might be both more likely to get what you want. I wanna thank all of my graduate students who've assisted in this research and also our funding source, which is the Social, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And thank you all for being here and for listening today.